So, Israel Keys, just because I hate him so much, here's a cat. Say hello, Cookie. This is the story of Israel Keys. Even she hates him. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan. With me as always is Les. You okay? Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's right, the cat's gone now. Um, Thought she was going to go for the headboard. She was that. that. It's not my headboard. Yeah, it's not a dead body. Les just couldn't be honest movies. Um, yeah, so welcome. Um, yes, this is on Israel Keys now. Everyone... It's like, oh no, he was so cool because he barely killed kids and oh, he's a fucking he's shit. And he hey, gets, back up. He barely kill kids. Kids. Oh, kill kids. Oh, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. Um, he's knob. He, he's got shit taste in music. He's like into all these new metal. And oh, I, do, I, I can't stand him. He's just, he's the poor man's BTK. Yeah, I remember this guy because we've tried to do this guy. Before. Yeah, and I got halfway through the episode. I was like, I can't. We literally looked at each other, didn't we? And went, like, There's this wang. I hate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. People that don't hate, though, are our patrons. We have, let's open a drink Kelly Weaver, Liv Templeton, Elizabeth Lee, Krista Francis, Verena Schmidt, <laughs> Angelina Cheshire. I don't know why I say it like that every time. Kiki Fan and Mandy Madden, Yulata Pang, uh, Becky Louise, Jules Henderson, Casey the Cannibal, and Amanda Champagne. And with our um, free members who like to just say, We love you. Like they just give us a mug. No tugs. Um, hugs, no tug. There you go. Um, Nicola Walker, Slashy B, Lisa O'Neill, Heather Hill, Alexandra Gutierrez, and Melanie. Just Melanie. Just Melanie. Like, share. You have to drop us an email, Melanie, and just tell us, you know, why is it just Melanie? Well, no, if Weaver can actually weave. Um, Answer uh, in the comments. Yeah, but if you do want to, um, you know, be part of that cool group so we can think about your names a bit too much uh, go to www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark anything from a dollar up to fifty dollars you get free stuff you get t-shirts mugs stickers loads of stuff um you can also join the membership thing on youtube for like 2.99 you don't get much you'll get a shout out in in the name credits at the end but yeah anyway that's enough fucking stalling let's get into the fucking Enough shilling. I hate this dickhead so much. Uh, anyway, so, Israel Keyes. He was born on January the 7th, 1979 in Richmond, Utah, and he was the child of Heidi Hawkinson and John Keyes. Now, while his dad appeared to be pretty much a non-entity, his mum played a significant role in his upbringing. Rather than the familiar narrative of abuse, Heidi's influence on Keyes stemmed from her attraction to cult-like religions. Now, initially Mormons residing in Utah, Keyes' parents soon transitioned to a more fundamentalist ideology, naming their subsequent children Isaac, Charity, Hosanna and Sunshine. Poor Isaac, for Israel. You know, Hosanna and Sunshine. That's a little better. Anyway, by the age of five, he's fun. Sunshine's a bit of a cop out, though. Yeah. I feel just like, uh, we got it's like, do you not have read like Exodus? Like, you could have called one of them Ishmael or something. Oh, like a girl called Ishmael. Yeah. Or Elizabeth, Rachel. That'd be a fucking easy one. I mean, she's going to name Sunshine. She's going to be a hippie. Anyway. By the age of five, his family embraced an off-the-grid lifestyle, relocating to a remote cabin without electricity near Colville, Washington, to join a fundamentalist Christian identity movement known as the Ark. Now, for those who are unfamiliar, Christian identity subscribes to the belief that Jewish people are not truly Jewish, but rather than white people, they're chosen by God. 
Now, the Ark has since adopted the milder moniker of Our Place Fellowship Church. Its doctrine espouses the belief that European whites, rather than Jews, are God's chosen people, citing Old Testament scripture as prophecy. According to their website, they assert that Americans, the British, and Western Europeans are truly the chosen people, contrasting them with what they describe as the Jewish peoples of today, whom they acknowledge are perhaps admirable individuals, but not genuine descendants of ancient Israel. Go over mm. there and say that. Yeah, I was going to say, because there's a lot of yeah. white, Caucasian tell, white people. Go over, Sorry. go over and tell Net and Yahoo that, see how far you get. Anyway, although this rhetoric may seem relatively subdued compared to other Christian identity doctrines, it has been notably toned down from its 1990s iterations. Now, this community was also the upbringing ground for um, Chevy and Shane Kehoe, who grew up near Israel Keys. In 1995, Chevy Kehoe was a white supremacist who made it a family of three and disposed their bodies in a swamp. The association with pro-white national ideologies appears to have influenced the aggressive tendencies of the Kehoe brothers. They were occasional residents of Elohim City, which had the significant connections to the Oklahoma City bombings and Timothy McVeigh. Now, unlike the Keogh brothers, Keyes did not subscribe to the white supremacist views. However, like them, he was homeschooled. While it's essential to note that the most homeschooled children do not become psychopaths, the lack of socialization certainly had an impact on individuals like Israel Keyes. Now, his childhood wasn't traumatic, really. It was characterized by instability, akin to experienced by millions of others. Look, Nonetheless, though, like many other criminals, Keyes exhibited early signs of the path he would later tread. At the age of 14, he developed a habit of carrying a handgun wherever he went. Alongside a friend, they engaged in house burglaries, although there is no evidence to suggest they inflicted harm on anyone during these incidents. However, their friendship came to an abrupt end when Israel killed a cat. The zoo. Sorry, Cookie. She's like, what? Yeah, you, you, you cover your ears with your little paws like that. That would have been a like Dagwood segue, the way she did that, just like Yeah, she was she, she, she was, was like, like, like sorry, she was like What? What? So Israel had repeatedly warned his sister that if a cat continued rummaging through the trash, he would take drastic action. Like that. Like, she, she's angry. So one day Israel accompanied by his friend and another sister took the cat into the woods, tethered it to a tree with he is cookie. Covered it, tethered it to a tree with a bungee cord and callously shot it in the stomach with his twenty two revolver. Now he found amusement in the suffering of the animal while his friend was so appalled by the act he vomited. I mean you would, wouldn't you? You sure the cat. This is what kind of a prick he is, yeah. BTK didn't do that. Don't shoot cats. BTK did a lot of bad stuff. Um you know, Denny Frady was a fucking nerd. But, you know, Israel Keys is like the new metal BTK. It's not as good. It's like it's when the it keeps rolling, yeah. rolling on the cat. No, we're not on about we're not past the cat now, anyway. So at the age of 17, Israel began to rebel against his fundamentalist parents, declaring himself an atheist. Like, I don't believe in your weird religion, mom. I'm an atheist. Oh, well, well, it's not a phase. Fucking 18. According to Israel's future wife, his parents wielded religion as a tool of control, using Bible passages to justify their judgmental attitudes. Interestingly, the only unconventional belief Israel seemed to inherit from his mother was a staunch opposition to vaccines. The BTK got his daughter vaccinated. Yeah, there he is. Shot a cat, don't believe in vaccines. I'm thinking you religious people out there, he's an atheist. There you go. What a prick. Subsequently, Israel's parents expelled him from their home and relocated to Maine, where they joined the Normish community. I'm just going to say these people, settle on one thing. You were Mormons, then you were white supremacists, saying you were God's chosen people, and now you're the Amish. The Amish are pretty dodgy. Like... I mean, at least they... The, the build thing. They work hard. They work hard. They're, They're grafters, what, aren't they? Honestly, them say what you want Mondays about yeah. From Sunday. Say what you want about the Amish. The uh, good beards as well. Good beards. Good grafters. Nice hat. Nice hat. Remind me of the fucking freaky guy from Poltergeist too. 
Oh, don't. No, he's, like, he's horrible. Oh, oh. Carolyn, come to me, chap. He was horrible, he was. Wasn't he? He would die in a cancer when he did that. He was. You could tell, couldn't you? He was, oh, the only guy that fucking scares me, that bloke does. He is terrifying. He is one of them scarred for life sort of people. Still don't know why my mum, you know, rest your soul, mum, let me watch Puddle Guys too when I was like six. She made some choices in her life, my mum did. So that was one of them. If it's any consolation, my mum and dad, like, they used to go for a lie down in the afternoon. Yeah, we, we all know what that meant. To leave me with jewels on. To be fair, though, George is funny. It's fucking mint. But it's like, it's all great. It's all fun and games. It's when the shark's doing this thing. You but then as soon as Ben Gardner's fucking head goes, bloop, like that, that's fucking... Even though you can't watch Jaws without masturbating. Well, I can't fucking see decapitations. Without thinking of your, your, your dad having head off your mum. <laughs> it's weirdly linked. Neurons that, like, wire together, fire together. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so around the time he got kicked out of his home, Israel was suspected he committed his first murder. Now, although he confessed to only a fraction of his crimes because he was edgy, he was like, oh, give me a peanut butter, a Snickers, and an Americano, and I'll give you two. Well, he couldn't deal with a real Snickers, like a real... No, he had to have peanut butter. Had to have peanut butter. What a fucking way about. Yeah. Anyway, he was suspected of committing his first murder. And then mm. He only did these... He only were made to a couple. But the timing aligns with this as him as a primary suspect. So on May 3rd, 1996, the 12 year old Special Olympics champion who competed in prosthetics division vanished after leaving her residence. Do not laugh. Do not laugh. That's what I say, I think. Why did you do that? Why do not laugh. That? Do not laugh now. A month later, her prosthetic legs were discovered at the mouth of the Colville River. I told you not laugh. However, her remains were not found until two weeks later when a group of children stumbled upon her skeletal remains in a wooded area. Those kids, that was the best summer of their life. Well, that's basically the plot of... Stand by me. Stand by me. <laughs> <laughs> Got no wax. But, you know, still. Um, at the time of the incident, Israel Keys was 18. Have you seen one of them fucking blades, though? You should, I mean... She couldn't have been that good of an Olympian, could she? Well, she was a Paralympian. She was in the prosthetics division. Yeah. She was 12. Picking on this poor dead girl. He's she really had no legs. Darwinism. What's she going to do? Os Oscar Pistorius, everything. Doesn't she? But that happens, doesn't it? I'm just saying. I mean, that's happened once to him. Just saying there's no smoke without fire. So what you're saying there is every Paralympian is a murderer. I mean, what well, I don't get, right, sorry to go off on a tangent here, but I was watching the yeah. Paralympics once, right, you got those guys on those blades, right, mm. they fucking go dead fast, right, in a race with a guy who's just got no arms, he's got normal legs, just running, and they're uh, on, like, fucking bionic legs, that's not a fair race. No, because, like, he can't stabilize. Oh, exactly. This one, I was watching it like, well, they're winning, and they did. And I'm like, if I was that lad with no arms, I'd like, do you know what? Fucking poses. Well, I've been watching the Great British Menu. Where's this going? Well, they, their theme for this year is, like, the Olympics, but also with Paralympics thrown in. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when it was called the Special Olympics. Can you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it was the Special Olympics, and then they stopped that. I just don't, like, see, like, how, like... I mean, it's nice and everything, but if I wanted a canopy, I don't want it served on a blade. What the fuck? What, what's that got to do with... What's that got to do with anything? I've just got a preference. Okay. We, know, we all know the irritable person and also how you like your canapes. You've never had a canapé in your life. No, I've had a canapé. You've been with me when I had a fucking canapé. Were they canapés? 
We did have canopies at that, like, sort of that thing we went to. We did have canopies. To be fair, I don't know what a canopy looks like. It's just like a tiny little. They used to, like, in them little, like, sort of nice, well, not nice, because they're horrible, then, like, puff pastry, like, sort of shells. Oh, yeah, and then you bite into it and, like, this fucking. And it's horrible. Cool. Yeah. Just remember, like, looking at you, like, when the salmon, like, fucking dish with all those different, like, beetroots. And yeah. I looked at you and just went, no. Hung over, weren't we? Mm. Anyway, so he was residing around Colville. Um, pro- approximately a year or two later, he admitted to raping a teenage girl who had been tubing down the Deschutes River near Oregon. He claimed it was his first violent sexual act, but similar to notorious killers like Ted Bundy and Richard Ramirez, who often begin with crimes against children, it's likely his true victims remain undisclosed. Now, about a year later in 1998, he enlisted in the army, serving as a specialist in Alpha Company 1st Battalion 5th Infantry. That's a long name. Yeah. Alpha Company 1st Battalion in the 5th Infantry. Just say the in the 5th Infantry. He spent a significant portion of his military tenure stationed at Fort Lewis in Washington or Fort Hood in Texas. Now, during his time in Fort Lewis, um, Keyes decided to explore the local singles chat line advertised in the Tacoma News Tribune's wanted ads. Now, these were the things where you'd phone up and, like, you'd see, like, a name like, um, 42 bubbly, bubbly personality. Um, fat. Um, you know, and you'd phone up and you'd leave a voicemail for them. And if they liked the voicemail, you'd give them a call back and all that stuff. It's, it's the 90s before Tinder, this was like kids. Now, the chat line operated by allowing users to leave a greeting for others to listen to. Interested individuals could then leave messages in a user's inbox. However, Keyes made an error while attempting to reply to a woman's message inadvertently recording over his original greeting. Fortunately, a woman using a pseudonym of Tammy Hawkins found his mistake endearing. After discovering they shared interests in new metal music and Rob Zombie movies, as they arranged a date. Sorry. And so, uh, this is what dating was like in the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm just going to have to... Yeah, just go kill the cow. So following dinner at Applebee's, they went for a drive and ended the evening with a movie, soon thereafter entering into a relationship, but it was House of a Thousand Corpses. 98 time. Yeah, that's House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah. Devil's Rejects came out later. Yeah. They're both good films, though, are, yeah. to be fair. Like, 31 was shit. Everything is put out after, I'd say, is quite shit. Three from Hell wasn't the best. Three from Hell was awful. Because he just these get he just tries to get rich break into everything now, doesn't he? Yeah. After what's his name, Sid Haig. Yeah. God rest your soul, by the way. And his so. wives and everything. Sherry Moon. I haven't watched the monsters. Um I don't know though, I'm kind of tempted by the monsters a little bit. But it's just like this sort of thing of like they've redone the monsters, they've redone the Adams family with what's Ortega. Who dead good Wednesday. Oh, yeah, yeah. By the way. Um but Catherine Jones is mortician with them. Yeah. Well the, the guy is Gomez, like everybody was shitting on. And the guy like, who played Uncle Fester. Yeah. It's an Uncle Fester. Like, show now. Yeah, but I don't just want Wednesday on her own. Like, just give me the whole Adams family. Yeah. You say Pugsley was a bit of a bitch, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the, the, the fucking mo- like, not the grandmother. Is she the grandmother? Who's in, like, the kitchens and stuff? She's funny as fuck. Yeah. Anyway, while Keys was deployed, Tammy learned that she was pregnant. It was then that Keys confessed to having a 19-year-old fiancé back in Colville. Despite this revelation, Keith broke off the engagement and received an honourable discharge from the army, eventually marrying Tammy Hawkins. Though not without flaws, Keith exhibited controlling behaviour and struggled with alcoholism, consuming excessive amounts of liquor, wine and beer in one sitting, according to Tammy. You're right, Emily. In 2001... <laughs> Why did you ask that? <laughs> 
<laughs> they moved to a rental house on the Maka Indian Reservation where Tammy was a member of the tribe. Now, Keyes found employment with the tribal council in the Parks and Recreation Department, a position he seemed to enjoy. However, Tammy frequently travelled to work. Keyes, or Izzy, as she affectionately called him, spent considerable time alone. During this period, Tammy observed the changes in Keyes. He immersed himself in new metal music, opened an online poker account under the pseudonym Black Heart, and adorned himself with an upside down cross branded on his chest and a pentagram tattooed at the base of his neck. What and it was a fuck? fucking heartogram, not the hit. Like, like him. Anyway, well, like Tom- Bam Margero for like yeah. fucking ever. So while Tommy considered these changes a phase, Keys was tapping into something darker. He was like, it's not a phase, Tommy. In his confession, Keyes reveals that shortly after leaving the military, he felt an increasing urge to kill, a compulsion he believed he needed to act upon. It's speculated that in 2001, this compulsion led him to commit his first murder. Now, the FBI suspects that Keyes initiated his killing spree between July and October of 2001, but the details surrounding these murders remain unknown, the locations, methods and victims he wouldn't give him up because he's a bitch. Now, given the pattern observed in his later crimes, it's reasonable to infer that Keyes lightly employed his previous modus operandi for killing for most of his killings, stabbed followed by strangulation. However, he admitted that his second and third victims were killed by blows to the head, intended to incapacitate rather than kill. Now, these victims, a couple whose identities remain unknown, were reportedly buried somewhere in Washington state. Following this, Keyes began embarking on road trips. In February 2004, he rented a car in Salt Lake City and kept it for seven days, covering 522 miles during the period. Now, there's no concrete evidence of murders during this trip. It does align with his established pattern. Until his final victim, he never executed murders close to home. Instead, he would rent a car, travel to an unfamiliar territory, abduct his victims, transport them to another state for the killing, and then dispose of the bodies elsewhere. Now, some have labelled him a mastermind for seemingly meticulous planning, but his method was essentially just driving. Essentially. That's... It's just driving, really. It's a calculated yet straightforward approach. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, between 2005 and 2006, Keeve repeated the state-to-state pattern twice dumping bodies in the remote reaches of Crescent Lake and Washington after weighing them down with milk jugs to facilitate sinking. Meanwhile, Keyes' personal life was in turmoil. Tammy battled with severe opiate addiction, leading to the deterioration of their relationship. Eventually, Keyes moved out, taking their daughter with him. In the midst of their subhezal, Keyes met Kimberly Anderson on Match.com. Match.com. Four Tinder. Their relationship quickly blossomed, and when Kimberly received a job offer in Anchorage, Alaska, she invited Keyes to join her. In 2007, Keyes relocated to Anchorage and established his own contracting business, Keyes Construction. They'll come up with something better. Anyway, how I'll just shit on this guy so much. I'm just, just, just yeah, I'm sorry, you fucking one. Anyway. Despite the demands of his business, Keyes continued his murderous activities. On Halloween 2008, he flew to Seattle, rented a car, and embarked on a three-day journey spanning as far south as Arizona. Now, the FBI strongly suspects that Keyes committed a murder during his trip to Wyoming, evidenced by his purchase of a fishing license. Now, he often used fishing trips to his cover while disposing bodies, blending the activities to create an alibi. Now, it's during this period that Keyes began hiding what he referred to as his kill kits in various states across the country. Now, he used five-gallon plastic buckets, stash guns, knives, ammunition, wires, rip, flashlights for future use of murders. Now, among the locations where Keyes claimed to have buried kill kits were Green River, Wyoming, and Port Angeles, Washington. To date, two of these kits have been discovered, one in Winooski River, nature area in Vermont and another near the Black Falls Reservoir outside of Parish Hill, New York. It is believed that the kill kit found near Black Falls Reservoir was used in the murder of Deborah Feldman, abducted from New Jersey on April the 9th, 2009. 
You know, he admitted to abducting a woman on that date and taking her to New York, where he murdered her and buried her near Tupper Lake. Now, you might wonder how he financed his travels, or his rental cars and other expenses. He claimed to have robbed multiple banks during his cross-country journeys, corroborated by a bank robbery he committed on April the 10th, 2009, the day after he likely murdered Deborah Feldman. Now, his bank robbery... Mo. He would research towns online, seeking smaller locales with several routes out of town. Once he identified a suitable target, he would wear a disguise, enter the bank, demand everyone get on the ground. In Top Lake, New York, he utilized a 40 caliber handgun to abscond with $10,000. Surveillance footage captured entering a bank wearing gloves, sunglasses, jeans, and a beard disguised it. While it was obviously artificial, as it closely resembled real hair. He probably okay. shaved his pubes off and stuck them on his face. It's like, I can't grow a real like beard. Like Team America, where it's yeah. like, do they do that? So the day after the robbery, he checked into the Handy Suites Hotel in Essex, Vermont, staying for four nights. During his stay, he deposited his gun in a kill kit, along the path at the Woodside Natural Area for later use. On April the 14th, Keyes took a flight back to Alaska, but following another trip where he covered 280 miles in a Ford Focus over three days out of Sacramento, he opted to pause his ventures in the lower 48 due to the birth of his daughter. Now, instead of travelling south in April 2011, he decided to explore closer to home. He constructed a homemade silencer in his shed using parts from Home Depot and ventured to Point, um, point War Warren's Off Park in West Anchorage with a rifle. Now, around 10pm, he set up a makeshift sniper's nest in the bushes and observed a young couple sitting in a car. However, just before he pulled the trigger, a police cruiser intervened, prompting the couple to leave. Keyes later claimed he wasn't intending to kill them, but was merely testing his homemade silencer. Shortly after this failed attempt, Keyes staked out the North Fork Trailhead in the Eagle River in Alaska. He preferred for a potential kill by burying a shovel and a bottle of drain cleaner in a garbage bag nearby. The plan was to murder whoever arrived at the parking lot, dig a hole and accelerate decomposition using the drain cleaner. However, no one appeared, so Keyes would return home empty-handed. He's like, oh, I can't believe they didn't come for me to kill them. It would have been so awesome. Fucking hate Israel Keyes. Now, before his final three known murders, Keyes hinted at two other victims. One was described as a woman with a, with a wealthy grandmother, pale skin and an older car. However, these descriptions were solely provided by Keyes, wanting some scepticism. Keyes also made occasional trips to Montreal to visit brothels, along with visits to Mexico and Belize, suggesting potential international victims. However, the murders we can definitely attribute to Keyes are those of Bill and Lorraine Courier. Now, in June 2011, he flew out of Ted Stevens International Airport in Anchorage and returned to Essex, Vermont, where he had stashed a kill kit after the presumed murder of Deborah Feldman. On June the 7th, Keyes checked into the same handy suites hotel he'd stayed in three years earlier. He obtained a three-day fishing license for a leisurely time on Lake Champlain before executing his next murders. After fishing, he retrieved his gun, zip ties and a headlamp from his kill kit before driving back to Essex. Before heading out for fishing, he scouted around Essex, intending to select a church to burn down post-murder. So edgy. However, he settled on targeting an abandoned farmhouse instead. Can't even do that right. Hello. Fucking BTK, like, took somebody to a church, killed him, took photos of him, Oh, and then left him uh, all while he said he was going to get aspirin when he was on a scouting trip. Same, BTK is better. So on the June the 8th, armed with a 40 caliber semi-automatic keys, cable ties, duct tape, a blindfold, a headlamp, he prepared for his gruesome mission. Now, initially targeting a low man with a suitable vehicle near the Cornerstone apartment complex, Keith planned to rob a bank the following day. However, his plans were thwarted when a sudden rainstorm drove the potential victim indoors. Undeterred, Keyes devised a new plan. Opting to adopt a couple from their home, he sought out a residence on Colbert Street, ensuring no children were present. After cutting the phone line to test for alarms, he proceeded with his sinister scheme. Gaining entry through a garage window, Keyes moved stealthily inside, equipped with a headlamp, 
Wanting to catch the couple off guard, he broke a kitchen door window with a crowbar and swiftly reached the bedroom of Bill and Lorraine Courier. Now, using zip ties, Keyes restrained the couple and confiscated their belongings, including the mobile phones and Lorraine's Luger handgun. He then forced the couriers into their own car, with Lorraine in the front and Bill in the back, both bound and helpless. Convincing the couple were being kidnapped for ransom, Keyes made a detour to the handy suites to collect additional supplies, a shovel, trash bags and drain cleaner, before driving them to the vacant farmhouse he had selected for the heinous act. Now, upon arrival, Keyes first secured Bill in the basement before attending to Lorraine. However, she managed to break free momentarily, prompting a chase of subsequent restraints. In a disturbing sequence of events, he sexually assaulted Lorraine before fatally strangling her in the basement. Bill, who had also freed himself, was subdued by Keyes with a shovel blow to the head. How shit is he at restraining people? These two... <clears throat> got away, both of them. He then shot Bill multiple times, citing a loss of temper, going, ah, can't believe you're going to have my super duper knots. After ensuring both were deceased, Keys disposed of their bodies in heavy trash bags, doused them with drain cleaner, and concealed them in the basement. Following the horrific act, Keys burned the a suitcase containing the courier's belongings in a national forest and returned to Essex before witness, to witness the aftermath of his crime. Reveling in the chaos, he then travelled to Chicago before eventually setting on his next target, a small coffee hut called Common Grounds Espresso in Anchorage, Alaska. Now, there wasn't anything particularly notable about this spot, except that it stayed open later than other coffee stands, and he made it an ideal target for Keyes. Now, after scouting the location for a few days, he determined that a low nighttime traffic made it perfect for his plan. In preparation, he purchased a police scanner to, to monitor the nearby law enforcement activity. At home, he prepared a secluded place to commit the murder once he selected his victim. With a shed conveniently located on the side of his house, he set up two heaters to combat the February Alaskan cold and spread a 9 by 12 tarp on the floor to manage any resulting blood from his next crime. He also placed a couple of links of rope and screwed eye bolts into the wall. With everything set, he left his house and parked his 2004 Chevy Silverado in the Home Depot parking lot. Around 8pm, Keyes heard chatter over the scanner about a significant event across town, diverting police attention. He got out of his truck and headed towards the coffee stand where 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was closing up. As he approached the kiosk, he hadn't fully decided on his course of action. While he intended to rob the place, he was, wasn't sure about how many employees were working that night. Unfortunately for Samantha Koenig, she was alone, having worked there only a month. When Israel Keys arrived, his twenty-two concealed in his jacket pocket. He ordered it in Americano and then went and Samantha turned her back to prepare the drink. He drew his gun and pointed it at her and when she turned back around. He instructed her to turn off the lights and he climbed through the window and ordered her to kneel. As he began binding her hand behind her back, she mentioned that her father would arrive soon to pick her up. Now this posed a dilemma for Keyes, who typically avoided using his own car when committing crimes. However, as, as things have gone smoothly so far, he took the risk and pushed Samantha out the door after gagging her with napkins. He placed her in the passenger seat of his Silverado, informing her of his plan to hold her for ransom, though his intentions for survival were quite different. Now, after securing her, he transported her to the house he shared with his girlfriend. Now, astonishingly, he took the risk with his girlfriend, was awake in the living room just watching TV. Now, he informed Koenig that he had some errands to run to facilitate the ransom plan. He assured her that he would be monitoring his scanner and would ensure to arrive first appeared any police activity. Before departing, he turned off the lights and turned up the radio to mask any potential noise. Fucking gulp. Like, ooh, 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 or fucking corn blasting anti. <laughs> Not even good corn. Not even good corn. No. <laughs> his first, his primary task was to obtain Samantha's debit card. And now his plan involved using Samantha's phone to contact a friend or family member to deposit money into a bank account, which he would then use to withdraw it in her debit card. That's not the best plan, is it? No. I'm going to use your phone and your debit card. Now, after retrieving Samantha's wallet from her boyfriend's truck across town and returning home, he found his girlfriend asleep. 
He poured himself a glass of wine before donning his headlamp and entering the dark shed where Samantha was held captive. He untied it, laid her on the top, and further restrained her. He then brutally assaulted her, eventually choking her to death with a cable tie. Afterwards, he hung her lifeless body from a nearby shelf before returning to finish his wine. After completing his daily chores and ensuring everything was set for his upcoming Mexican cruise, Keyes returned to the shed, wrapped a body in the top and placed it in the shed cabinets, relying on the Alaskan coal to preserve the body until his return. He locked the shed doors, called a cab to the airport and embarked on his cruise, leaving grim scene behind. So he's gone off on a fucking cruise with this girl. He's just murdered this girl and left her in a shed on his house. Mm -hmm. Now, meanwhile, the search for Samantha began in Anchorage with surveillance footage showing only a vague image of a tall, white individual due to Key's manipulation of the lights. Now, the primary suspect initially targeted the Anchorage community was Christopher Bird. Now, this is the best part of this. Right? So... These people are, uh, we know who it is. It was Christopher Bird. He was an aspiring rapper known as White Tyson. And had a previous altercation with Samantha, sparking public sp um, speculation against him. Mm -hmm. The public outcry against Bird was so, against White Tyson, let's call him his name. White Tyson was so intensely expelled from barber school, resulting in the loss of his $6,000 tuition fee. Now, despite his mother's confirmation that he was home during the abduction because he was grounded, it took weeks for him to be cleared of suspicion as online accusations persisted. Can you imagine, like, yo, for real, my mom said, you can't go out, you ain't doing your dishes, yo, for real, White Tyson. <laughs> White Tyson. White Tyson. I mean, I'm not sure if any rappers from Anchorage, Alaska, would make it. But, you know, Eminem made it for him, eight mile in Detroit, didn't he? You mean Detroit's got a fair pedigree for that sort of thing? Anchorage. Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage, mm, Alaska. Not really. Mm. I still feel bad for him. He was kicked off to barber school, lost $6,000, and had to admit that if the reason he did it was because he couldn't do it because he was grounded. Him. Right, before returning to Anchorage, Keyes had other plans down south. Although the details of his activities during the cruise remain unknown, upon his return, he embarked on a string of bank robberies before heading back to Alaska. In Aledo, Texas, Keyes set fire to a house and barn outside of the city to divert law enforcement attention away, facilitating a bank robbery. However, he inexplicably observed the emergency response from a nearby hill instead of doing the robbery. He's just there, he's like, I'm so fucking smart. Look at me. All oh, these people are here because of me. And then he forgot rubber band. Now, he executed his plan in Hazel, Texas, disguising himself with a hard hat, glasses, gloves, and a respirator, adorned with the taped human hair to alter his appearance. He successfully robbed the National Bank of Texas before returning his rented car in Houston and catching a red-eye flight to Anchorage. Upon his return, he, return, he checked... Koenig's body, ensuring it remained undisturbed. He then spent time with his daughter before returning to the shed to proceed with his plan. Fucking dickhead. However, due to the freezing weather during his absence, retrieving the body required dismantling the cabinet. After cleaning up and thawing the body, he committed necrophilia and purchased a Polaroid camera from Target. The following day, he purchased makeup similar to Samantha's fishing line and sewing needles from Walmart. He also acquired newspapers for a ransom note from a grocery store's recycling dumpster, completing his preparations. Now, Keyes understood that he wouldn't receive any ransom money unless she could convince others that she was still alive. The makeup and the fishing line were essential tools for this deception. He meticulously applied makeup to her face and body for three hours to create the illusion of vitality. Now, given the natural expressionlessness of the face, he used tape and superglue to imbue it with some emotion, while the fishing line was, and needles allowed him to control the expression in her eyes. It took several attempts, but he eventually captured the desired effect in a Polaroid picture of the body next to February 13th edition of the Anchorage Daily News. 
After taking the photo, he drafted a ransom note filled with false information and demanded $30,000 to deposit into Samantha's bank account. He sealed the note and photo in a Ziploc bags and drove his girlfriend's car to Connor's bog dog park. There he pinned the ransom note and Polaroid under a missing dog flyer near the park's entrance. Keys then turned on Samantha's phone and sent a text to her boyfriend, Connor, directing him to the park with the message, Ain't she pretty? When Connor received the text while having lunch with it, Spencer's father, they hurried to the park, found the package, and promptly notified the police, careful not to disturb the scene. Now, despite the precautions, the police found no substantial leads on the note, text, or photo, and began promptly um, preparing to comply with Key's demands. Meanwhile, despite the winter conditions in Alaska, decomposition had begun. Key's considered briefly hiding the body in a snowbank, but opted for a more permanent solution. He dismembered the body using wire tourniquets on each limb to minimise bleeding. After then, he cut off the limbs one by one with a utility knife, placing them in rolling tote bags. After triple bagging the tote and garbage bags, he stored them in the shed until he was ready to move them. With all the necessary preparations made, Keyes transported the first package to in Matanoski Lake, north of Anchorage. Aware that moving the entire body at once would attract attention, he made two separate trips to the frozen lake, disposing of the body parts through holes in the ice under the guise of ice fishing, even constructing a hut for himself to maintain the facade. The head, legs and arms were wrapped in baling wire and attached to heavy fishing weights before being dropped into the icy depths. Then he spent five hours fishing out of the same hole and managed to catch a few fish which he cooked and then fed, fed to his daughter and girlfriend, all the while disposing of his victim's remains. The following day he disposed of the torso in a similar manner and even had more success catching fish. Fucking nerd. After disposing of the body, he felt confident enough to check her account to see if the ransom money had been deposited. How he However he, disposi- no. However, he discovered that only $5,000 had been deposited, far short of the 30000 he demanded. Despite considering himself a genius, he overlooked the withdrawal limit of £500 a day, uh, $500 a day for most of ATMs, realising that his plan was flawed unless he intended to visit it. numerous ATMs over the following months. Oh, an idiot. <laughs> on the first day he managed to withdraw a thousand dollars from two atms while concealing his identity naturally the police monitored atms for likely withdrawals but in a city as large as anchorage they could only cover about 50 of them aware of this keys decided it was risky to continue withdrawing money locally and embarked on another trip in the early march he flew to las vegas rented a white 2012 ford focus from avius and drove to Dallas, possibly to retrieve a gun from a kill kit. After obtaining his kill kit, he returned to Arizona and withdrew $400 from an ATM in a small town of Wilcox. An hour and a half later, he was in Lordsburg, New Mexico, where he hit the daily limit again, managing only to withdraw another $80 a year. Here, he made his first mistake. Although ATM camera quality aren't great, the F. FBI enhanced the footage enough to identify the car belonging to a man, to the man using Samantha's debit card as a white 2012 Ford Focus. Sensing that this car might have been spotted, he drove for 13 hours across New Mexico and Texas, eventually stopping at an Avis to exchange his rental car. He believed that by switching cars while withdrawing money, he could evade the police. However, when he attempted to exchange the 2012 white Ford Focus, he was given another identical car, frustrating his efforts to conceal his identity. <laughs> anyway, just before swapping the car, he withdrew another $480 from an ATM, putting the Texas police on a high alert. Now, you don't want to do that. No. But Keyes had another reason for being in Texas besides just draw- withdrawing money. It also happened to be the weekend of his sister's wedding. After getting the car, he drove to Nacogdoches, northeast town of Wells, where his extended family had fallen into another cult. Not even Amish now. Following the wedding, he left in his car and in that lot the last weekend as a free man. A few days later, Texas Highway Patrol caught up to his rail keys. A full be on the lookout had been put out on the Ford Focus. Well, that's called a bolo. Bolo. Bolo? 
Now, Keyes had parked his Ford Focus conspicuously outside the Quality Inn of Luck in Texas. A patrol car spotted it, ran the plates and discovered it had been rented to one Israel Keyes of Anchorage. They decided to handle the situation by the book, waiting for Keyes to slip up, which he did almost immediately. Upon leaving his room and driving down the road, he exceeded the speed limit by one mile an hour, leading to his immediate pullover. Upon searching the car, they found a gun, money from a bank robbery, the mask he had worn when withdrawing the money from the ATMs, and most damningly, his debit card and cell phone of Samantha Koenig. Oh, that's a schoolboy error there. He's a genius, though. Yeah, he's, and he listens to new metal. Oh, I'm a genius. He's sensitive. He's got feeling. Keyes knew he was in serious trouble and swiftly transported back to Alaska to face justice. Aware that the evidence against him was overwhelming, he quickly confessed to everything. Now, he expressed a desire to keep the detail out of the public eye, claiming concern for his daughter's future, but the sentiment rang hollow given his horrific crimes. Now, I've watched these interrogations and he just sits there like, like with his Americano and his cigars and these peanut butter snickers he got again. Yeah. He's got a horrible little laugh like dickhead. So during his years I will put up the interrogation videos on the channel and then you guys watch him and then tell me you don't want to just This is almost like your hatred for what's the name? But it's like writ large. What what was the name? I hate a lot of people. That that one you really hated that we did, Stacy. Some I know who you mean, but go on. But that's not a Stacy, is it? No. Um, Jody Arias. Jody Arias. That was it. Because a, I had to do a hundred hours of that stupid cow. It's like, mm. That stupid cow. That stupid cow. Oh, this, is, this is like reaching those. So this is like, <laughs> like Jody Arias. Like, you know, no, I, I hate this guy way more than Jody. I hated Jody Arias just because she was annoying. I had to research a little. I say, no, during the interrogation sessions, he la he talked at length, often demanded specific items like Americanos peanut butter snicker bars and cigars in exchange for information. However, as Alaska does not have the death penalty, he began admitting to murder after murder, including the killing, the killings of Bill and Lorraine Courier. Now, basically, he said, I want the death penalty. Give me the death penalty. They were like, well, we don't do that and, they, No, they didn't. They were like, well, we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. Don't you worry. We'll see what we can do. Just give, it, just give us a couple more. Give us a couple more. Then he'd be like, oh, maybe a cigar will refresh my memory. <laughs> And like be that again. Can't remember anything. That's all he went for. Yeah. I just feel like a line of Charlie. Like So basically he told him where he'd be where he'd put the bodies of Bill and Lorraine. But by the time he told him where it was, their um, the abandoned farmhouse had been demolished and the remains were not found in the rubble. But so they weren't because they just thought it was stinky. Like, they were like, oh, fucking hell, what's that smell? Yeah. Probably like a dead cat or something. Thrown so the fucking, that rubble's gone now. So they're never finding them bodies. However, evidence retrieved from his home computer linked him definitely to the area. Now, initially, he believed that police, where he, uh, he had the police where he wanted them, expected a swift execution. However, authorities knew that bringing him to trial would take years. They played along, keeping him cooperative by entertaining his demands. Over time, he became increasingly guarded, revealing less and less as he caught on to their tactics. So when news of Keyes' status as a serial killer and his responsibility for Samantha Koenig's death broke, he stopped cooperating. He said he felt betrayed and ticked off. Ticked off? Was yeah. he ticked off? Basically, he said he wanted his daughter to have a normal life so she could go on the internet and not find anything about him so she could have a normal... Because he, to be fair, he loved his daughter. Like his daughter was his, but maybe like, not be a prolific, yeah, serial killer, yeah. So, a bad one, yeah. So, after realizing that he wouldn't receive immediate resolution from the state, he opted to evade the consequences of his crimes by taking matters into his own hands. On December the 2nd, 2012, Israel Keyes fashioned a noose from a bedsheet, 
securing one end round his neck and tying the other one to his left ankle. Using a contraband razor, he then inflicted deep cuts on the wrists, ensuring that if the blood loss didn't prove fatal, the strangulation from the loss of consciousness would. To minimise detection, he ingeniously used empty milk containers and cups to collect as much blood as possible where he remained conscious. This precaution aimed to prevent any indication of cell phone from seeping out under his cell doors. Now, Israel Keed fucking died, and he couldn't leave without telling the world what he thought of him one last time, and he did so in a long-winded, new metal influence slam poetry suicide note. Are you ready for this? I don't know, but she loves slam poetry. I can't love it. Are you ready? Just reminds me of it like um, Only Sunny, where Charlie and Dee start doing slam poetry. It's just amazing. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Where will you go, you clever little worm, if you bleed your host dry? Back in your ride, the night is still young. Streetlights push back, the black eye neat rose. Off to the right, a graveyard appears, lines of stones, bodies moulder below. Turn away quick, bob your head to the seat, as straight through the stop sign you roll. Loaded truck with lights off slams into your broadside. Your flesh smashed and metal explodes. You may, you may have been free. You, di- you loved your living your lie. Fate had its own scheme. Crushed like a bug, you still die. Soon now you'll join those ranks of dead of all your ashes. The wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed a few tears. Pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is you were just bones and meat. With your brain die- died, also your soul. Send the dying to wait for their death in the comfort of the retirement homes. <clears throat> Quietly, quickly say, it's for the best. It's for the best for you to sow their fate you'll not know. Turn a blind eye back to the screen, soaking your reality shows. Stand in front of your mirror and you preen in a plastic castle you call home. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of scheme, American eyes. Consume what you don't need, stars you idolize. Pursue what you admit is a dream, then it's American die. Get in your big car so you can go to work fast on roads made of dinosaur bones. Punching on the clock and sit on your ass, playing stupid ass games on your phone. Paper on your wall says you got smarts. The test you took told you so, but you would still crawl by the vermin you are once your precious powder grids blow. Power grids, sorry. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of the scheme, Americanize. Oh, and it goes on. Um, oh, no, this still goes on. You're sitting here for all of this. Now that I have held you tight, I will tell you a story. Speak soft in your ear so you know that it's true. You're my love at first sight, and though you're scared to be near me, my words penetrate your thoughts now now in an intimate prelude. I looked in your eyes. They were so dark, warming, and trusting, as though you had not a worry of care. The more guileless, spelling mistake, the game is the Better potential to fill up those pools with your fear. Your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through the highlights of red. What colour, I wonder, and how straight it will turn plaster back to the sweat of your blood. Blood doesn't sweat. No. Your wet lips were a promise of secrets unspoken. Nervous lasses that burst like a pulse of blood from your throat. There will be no more laughter here. Probably not. I feel your body tense up, my hand now on your shoulder, your eyes. Forget the lady called Locke, she does not abide near me, for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. Would I, that I keep you, let you be the master of your own fate, knowing full well what's at stake? My pretty kitty butterfly, colourful wings, my hand smears, I somehow repaint them with punishment and tears. Violent metamorphosis emerge my dark moth princess. I would <laughs> I would yeah. often worship on the altar of your flesh. You shudder with revulsion and try to shrink far from me. I'll have you tied down and begging to become my stock home, sweetie. Okay, talk is over. Words are placid and weak. 
Black it with action or the all comes off cheap. Watch close while I work now to the electric shock of my touch. Open my trembling flower or your petals I'll crush. That's it. And thus ends the ballads of Israel Keys, the knob. So, yeah, um, that was Israel Keys. He did make paintings, out, like he did skull paintings in his blood. Like, I think it was like 11, and then there was like a... Cr- Basically, he was trying to say, oh, I'd committed this many murders. Did he, know, did he do no demos? Because, like, I'm, I'm just wondering, I bet you... If we search this, somebody's somebody's done this. Somebody's done. Someone's going to fucking do it, but I'm not. It's oh, it's just so terrible, and he's just such a dick, and he's just like a really shit BTK. He's just he's um, I mean, like wow. I mean, that is no. Oh, I know. Why didn't you appear? No, it's not. I mean, oh, Annie, why didn't you appear? I mean, I know Shakespeare said, like, the brevity is the soul of wit, but that, that is something. That shit. That is, that is. I've never heard such verbal excrement writ large. No. Before. No. Um, I think that is the most horrible thing, and I think. I mean, Alaska, just based off that, Alaska should maybe start rethinking the death penalty. And also, well, he's already dead, but um, also, I know he did commit a lot of murders and stuff, but that's probably the worst thing he's ever done. You know, I'm with you there. Human life is precious. And did you laugh at that? I didn't. I was just clearing my throat. Uh, but um, slam poetry is shit. That's not slam. I thought slam poetry was meant to be like fucking brief. I had to sit through nigh on five minutes of that bullshit. I had to find that and copy and paste it onto here. You were prepared. You were prepared. I was not prepared. I know. You wanted to leave, and I was like, no, you fucking sit there. No, no. What I said was like, oh, and it goes on. That wasn't a, a fucking thing because I was I was in then I was like I may as well sit through. Was that for the Americanized one? Yeah, the you American can tell where he had about four different poems and he just shoved them like violent metamorphosis. I like the bit where he's clearly watched that like, Christina, uh, Chris, not Christina, Christina Aguilera, Christine here. What the fuck? Um, that Christina Aguilera video. A fighter where there's moths in that. Oh, yeah. Where he's clearly seen that. Because I feel like this was written over a number of days. It's like he goes Americanized and he's like, that's cool. That's fucking cool. Yeah, like, you know, Ameri- um, land of the free, land of the lie, land of the scheme, Americanize, consume what you don't need, stars you idolize. And it's just like. Yeah. But when he goes on about his moth bitch. Like later on, that was my favorite part. That's the bit where I broke. And then he's like, Open my trembling flower, or your petals I'll crush. Starts going off about driving and getting hit by a truck. Then he's banging on about like consumerism. And then he's like, It's like, Oh, God, I'm it's such a- better than you. I didn't consume any fucking. As a review, it's confused. Like, that's how I tell my review off of Israel Keys as well. Confused. I, I, Tie it off as shite. And all those people who tell me, oh no, he was so good because he buried these kill kits and oh, you know, he, did. he just went around and buried loads. I'll tell you what though, also, one day one ki- a kid is going to find one of those kill kits. It's going to have a load of money in. Like those kids who found that, um, I was going to say paraplegic, Paralympian's body. It's going to be the best summer of their lives, that is. They're not going to be able to use the money though, like surely. Why not? It's just kids. Not gonna I mean, if it's all like, hard, hard cash currency, it's like if they've got like new cash, then it's just like, oh, you should have like turned these in within like three months or else. I don't know if they do that in America. That's stupid, isn't it? I mean, I think we're just stupid. So. I mean, kind of, because like, look at what's going on with like Prince Charles. It's like reprint, reprint money now. Like, yeah, he's going to die soon, so let's not reprint money. Okay, mate. That's probably. 
Yeah, my wife's watching, um, as we speak, uh, she is watching um, TikTok conspiracy videos about Kate Middleton. She's like, some people have got a lot of time on their hands. I'm like, yes, they have. Yeah, but you're also watching this. Yeah, but people have got way too much time. She's literally waiting there, like l l sitting on the sofa, like waiting for me to come in. And she's just there watching TikTok videos as celebrity big brothers on. So that'll be why. Um, anyway, but yeah, thank you. Um, Israel Keys, he's shit, any? He? Yeah. yeah. There, there's no argument. No argument. Listen to that song poetry again. And tell me he's not shit. Also, to all those people who was like, no, he was dead good. What? The guy's a murderer. Yeah. Why is he dead good? He's horrible. He's new. What are you, why are you racing these people? He's also not BTK. I'm saying the same thing to you, but at the same time. I'm not, yeah, but I don't tend to be cool. No. I, I, I know my limits when it comes to me being Dennis Raider. And I am not Denny Schrader. Well, he was. Then. I cannot write yes. poetry like Denny Schrader. And neither can Israel Keys. Please. But yeah, um, if you do like it, um, remember, if you want to give money to us, you can do. You can, like, if you want to rob a bank, you know, launder the money, you can do. You can go to www.patreon.com. Leave us a kill kit? Yeah, oh no, don't leave us a kill kit. Just leave us money. Um www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark anything from a dollar up to fifty dollars is a thingy on YouTube now that you can like two ninety nine or the leave us some slam poetry. Yeah. It's been done before and it was shit. Yeah, yeah, leave us some slam poetry if you want to. Um leave a like, subscribe, comment, all that bollocks in the names of the patrons again up there. And I hate I fucking hate Israel Keys. My my annoyance of him i don't know if i hate him or he just really annoys me that was annoying it was so annoying the extreme. i don't think he deserves my hate he deserves my annoyance yeah yeah anyway i've been jan he's been les take care bye bye